Hello everybody and welcome to this week's episode of Activist Lawyer. I am delighted to be joined in the studio, joined in the studio, which is great, in person with, by Jude Copeland. Hi Jude. Hello. So you had a bit of a journey getting here, didn't you? Yes, it was absolutely <laughs> lashing. The <laughs> glorious city of Newry has never <laughs> looked <laughs> so damp. It's never looked so damp. Yeah, and you buses, trains, planes, automobiles to get here. Oh, definitely. And there wasn't even a scone waiting for you in this studio. How embarrassing. But um, we've got our team with a few biscuits, had a wee chat, and it's lashing, lashing outside, but we're nice and cosy here in our studio. And again, I appreciate you joining us here. It's always better to have the in-person um, chats in the studio and activist lawyer. But just a little bit of a background. So Jude is a solicitor advocate and he's working in legal technology for Cleaver Fulton Rankin in Belfast. That's the only office, isn't it, Jude? It's based in Belfast, yeah? Or yes, yeah. it is. So for um, existing clients, I guess, and law firms in England, Wales and Ireland. So you're a legal technology specialist. Hmm, interesting. I don't think we've had anyone on the show. Well, we had a few people who were working in cryptocurrency, which might be some somewhere related. But Jude is also on the Stormont All Party Working Group on LGBTQ issues. That's really interesting. We'll get to that. And also an organiser of Queer Space, which from talking to you is just a fantastic, fantastic organisation. Um, Jude is also working with the Law Society's Human Rights and Equality Working Group group and has a keen interest in diversity and inclusion so we're going to have a chat about that as well and gosh with, with so much to talk about within your work but also the the activism and the work that you do outside your work so we have a lot to get through but thank you so much for joining us again it's an absolute honour and I'm so excited and it's lovely to be here in Yuri chatting <laughs> to you, Sarah. Um, okay, well, just for our, we gave a little bit of a bio there, a little bit of a background, but maybe you might share with our listeners a little bit about your journey, how you got into the work that you're doing now with Cleaver Fulton and Rankin and how you, you came to specialise in that, if you don't mind. Thank you. Um I don't know where it started. Well, I kind of do. Um, I wanted to be a doctor in uh, secondary school and, you know, that was really, really what I wanted to do. Um, And then I went to a lecture in the Ulster Museum and it was given by a lawyer, a human rights lawyer on the Human Rights Act. Mm -hmm. And I became really fascinated by the idea of individuals having rights and the realms and the potential and really what that means on a day-to-day basis. And it, it, it was really an incredible lecture. It was given by Baroness Helena Kennedy, QC or KC now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was just so inspired. And yeah. I've, I've found that in my legal career that, you know, I think it's really important to have role models and inspirational figures mm-hmm. and people who have gone before you and they will show you the way to be a lawyer and actually to be an activist lawyer. Um, I was really, really honoured to meet Helena Kennedy um, a number of times whenever I was working in London and it was just really really lovely you know meeting Mm -hmm. somebody who was so down to earth and the way she explained law as really being like a tradesman's tradesperson's Mm -hmm. tools Um, you know we do use fancy words sometimes um, if we need to Um, but you know fundamentally People don't want lawyers. People want solutions yeah. to their advice and they want advice. And yeah, no family history in law um, at all, really. Mm-hmm. And I just became really fascinated, applied to a number of universities, got into Ulster University and went to Jordanstown. It was so it was so daunting. I just didn't yeah. know what to expect. And at the same time, I really started to, you know, I can only see this in hindsight now. Um, And I share this a lot whenever I'm going out and talking to students and, you know, people looking for their sort of next step in their early law career. I I just crashed. Um, I didn't understand that I was suffering from 
a really challenging time around anxiety and that was just linked to me not knowing who I was as a person and you know not realizing Mm -hmm. I know this will sound really odd to a lot of people but not realizing that you're gay um, because I had no role models and you know I'd never I didn't know very many lawyers and I definitely didn't know any LGBTQ lawyers so I just really really struggled um I became really anxious around exam times and I just stopped going to exams so I stopped going to exams and resat the year and didn't reset, reset the repeats and then eventually at one point I received a phone call and said right you just you can't yeah. We're throwing you out. Oh, that's tough. And I still remember um, going into the meeting and it really was just the kindness and the support of Amanda Zachary Palou, um, who's one of the lecturers there, um, that she saw the potential in me to become a lawyer. Yeah. And she gave me that support and I got that second chance. And... I eventually got my degree. I got a whole uh, tutu, um, which people are a bit sniffy about. But Mm. actually, what that means to me is that I was stronger than the anxiety that kept me back. And um, I don't know what will have happened by the time this podcast goes on air. Mm. But um, I started looking for training contracts in the economic crisis of 2008 2009 so that again was pretty grim (laughs) Uh, I kept getting places in the institute in Belfast and I kept not getting a training contract (laughs) so it was a bit of luck Um, I ended up training in a wonderful um, I I, I, had worked as a paralegal for um, a few years in incredible practices um, with amazing lawyers and yeah. you know very very kind lawyers who were keen to share their um experience and their skills with me and eventually I went to this tiny um office in Glen Gormley um Ted Lavery um was my master and it was an incredible experience it was very yeah. very different to what I'd been in before it was by far the smallest practice I'd ever been in um, but he was really, really committed to training me about how to be a lawyer. So it was more important for me to see lawyers in action and to go down to court and sit into into meetings mm-hmm. rather than me going and doing photocopying. Yeah. So I was very, very lucky. On, yeah. um, any opportunity to go to court or to go to police stations, um, I was there. Any interesting applications... I was allowed to go and there was just an incredible moment. I I think looking back on this, I think he set it up slightly deliberately. I don't know how he did, but I think he did. Um, My first appearance in court as a trainee um, was with a a divorce petition and it was a high court divorce um, for hearing. And I went down and I was petrified. I had memorised the petition. I'd memorised the marriage certificate. And I just, I was so petrified. I didn't know where to sit. Um, I I realised that at the last minute. And um, went in there and we were waiting around. And, you know, people say, you know, fake it until you make it. (laughs) I, I, I was trying to calm this very, very anxious client. And I was petrified. <laughs> um, and the, the barrister came along and said, oh, there, there's a problem. Um, uh, the judge has phoned in sick. <laughs> and the idea of a judge phoning in sick, I'm going... I don't really, I don't really think the judges got sick. I don't no. know what I thought. It sounds quite random, yeah. even though they're entitled to be. Sick. I mean, they are human. <laughs> Judge phoned in sick. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> so, um, really, really, just yeah, I, I was like wandering <laughs> round and thinking, okay, I don't know how to deal with this. Is there some application I should make? What do yeah, I do? Yeah, yeah. And um, then the barrister came over to me and she just said, "Oh, you know, you're in very good hands," and spoke to the client. You're in very good hands. Uh, 
we've got the chief coming down to do your divorce petition. So my first appearance in court was in front of the <laughs> then Lord Chief Justice. Um, and no better the wheels way. almost came off a couple yeah. of times. Um, but it, it, she had her moment in court yeah. and I had my first ever moment in court and we got what the client wanted. Good. And I bet you felt a huge relief after that. But oh, definitely. There's no better way I guess of being thrown there in the deep end and that's a very that's similar to the experience I had and lots of my colleagues but other people don't get that because they don't actually meet individual clients for quite a long time into their their training so that is a real eye-opener isn't it to kind of have to stand there um, I, I've had that feeling of anxiety and complete overwhelm but there's no better way I guess to to get you started yeah definitely <laughs> and I think you know as as COVID um, has changed the way a lot of mm. law practices work I think what is now almost more important is how we think about how we as lawyers communicate with our clients and you know the tone of Mm -hmm. emails and um just what what our clients expect because it's just nobody nobody goes to a Mm -hmm. solicitor for an enjoyable experience they go there because they're nervous and they have a problem they have an issue but so how then did you get involved in legal technology is that really an emerging area in the law what kind of issues are coming up in terms of your practice yeah it's really it's a really weird um i was thinking about this recently and um whenever i qualified um whenever i was at the institute Mm -hmm. actually I remember sitting in one of the tutorial halls, uh, one of the tutorial rooms, and so the tutor said that our reports were going to be going back to our masters, so the attendance was going to be monitored, Mm -hmm. and, you know, if you missed a number of tutorials, it was going to be reported back to your master. And we had to fill out forms. And I remember, (laughs) I remember sitting I, I really vividly remember because they were all, I loved my tutorial group. Um, they were brilliant lawyers. Well, they still are. Mm-hmm. Um, but I remember a couple of them saying, no, well, my master doesn't have an email address. Yeah. And then somebody else in the tutorial group said, we don't have computers. <laughs> and I was just going, how, 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 how do you, practice, how, how does this work? Um so you know that's that's yeah, yeah. where we sort of came <laughs> from, and there was, you know, looking back on it, although I'm only sort of tenish years, um, although this is only about ten, fifteen years ago, mm. every lawyer had a secretary, and now yeah. with automation and with increased use of legal technology, it's changing what we're doing. Yeah. So I ended up um, working for a global law firm in their disputes team. And it was really, really interesting because it showed how very dull tasks like looking through discovery, mm. disclosure, how that could be made a lot easier um, and kind of revolutionised by the use of technology. So it, it, it was actually kind of, it's the lazy way to yeah. do things because instead of looking at hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of documents mm-hmm. you can just look at the core of your case yeah and some people you know some people say oh well you know that's back office law sure but when it, whenever i'm managing review teams now i'm thinking about the case analysis that has been formulated by mm-hmm. a group of lawyers on you know some of my cases have been hundreds of thousands, millions, and actually tens of millions. Mm -hmm. There was one very large case that I worked on, and there was a huge team on that, and it was multi-billion pounds. And it just opened my eyes to the potential of legal technology Mm -hmm. and how you can actually do things and actually serve your client and your client's interests better by using a little bit of technology. A little um, bit of technology. What about the, the comments made recently? At, wasn't it the centenary? And they're saying yes. oh, there'll be no need for lawyers anymore because every. So are you are you that far ahead? Um, the comment was made about for anyone who doesn't know that technology will soon become so advanced that 
we may not even need lawyers and there's no need for lawyers as, as people, I suppose, because people, you know, have problems and they just need it fixed. And that can be done through automation. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all out of a job. <laughs> yeah, not the greatest message. But um, I think um, I think for context, that was Richard Susskind, who yeah. in, his, in the 1980s, he was publishing his PhD thesis on... AI, so okay. he's like so far ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, th- I think the point that he was making, um, I don't know how well it landed in that mm-hmm. group of lawyers, was that there are some things and we do them as lawyers mm-hmm. and they don't make much sense. Yeah. Um, I think my my one of my pet peeves is, you know, tradition for tradition's sake. So one example of this, and it's a, it's a minuscule example, but mm-hmm. it really irritates me, is a lawyer writing to another lawyer and the first line of their letter. So first of all, it's a letter. Like, why do you want to delay a response? But the first line of their letter is, uh, dear sirs, so obviously not really gender inclusive, mm-hmm. your client, our client, and then the name of the matter. But then the first line is, we refer to the above matter. And I am yet to meet a lawyer who can explain to me why that line is there. Because it just doesn't make any sense. Of course they're writing about that client matter. I'm doing a little bit of training today with some of our staff who will be supporting me, but that is just going to be sticking out for me when we're doing letter writing and how to kind of set our letters up on our case management. Yeah, stroke that out. It's not necessary. <laughs> you see, you're already using yeah. legal technology. You know, you're yeah. using case management. We do. We're, we're up there, you know, although I'm the worst in the world at, at managing that. But I am, I, I don't think I'm a dinosaur. I'm not that bad. Um, We're getting there and I do see the efficiency of it and the benefit of it. Now, it took me a while to get there because he did come from old, like, traditional methods. But um, it's definitely starting to work for us now. But, yeah, I mean, there's so much wasted. <laughs> wasted uh, and documents and files, paper files. Yeah. Absolutely everywhere freaks me out now because we I mean, don't really do that in here. Hazards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tripping hazards and fire hazards. Yeah, I'm just thinking of the firms I worked for years ago in Dublin. You'd be in t- like literally, you'd have this much space, like a square, because your <laughs> the rooms were piled up with decades old files and folders and papers, and you don't really see that as much anymore. Well, I'm hoping you don't, but maybe you do in other practices. But yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it's really weird. Um, I was I I joined Cleaver Fulton Rankin at the start of the year, and whenever I was coming down here. I thought to myself, I'm not even sure if we have a fax machine. Mm. And like, I remember, you know, even 10 years ago, you know, your contract was sent by fax. Yeah. And I don't like, I don't know how to send a fax anymore. <laughs> is there, I don't know if we is have Is there one. such a thing? See, I, think I just so. remember that we noise now, <laughs> that little ring noise through. Yeah, because everything came in through fax and litigation. You were just waiting for the other side to say, yeah, but I don't know. Yeah. We don't, we don't do faxes in here. So, yeah. But um, so aside from your um, day job, I guess, um, you're extremely busy with um, the legal technology uh, department and group within Cleaver Fulton Rankin. You are also equally, if not even more active, I don't know, outside of work. And I guess we'll talk a little bit about your projects outside because they're truly inspiring truly truly interesting and maybe how we can look at maybe diversity and equality in the legal workplace uh, based on your experience and your thoughts on that so one of the organizations there that you mentioned was the Stormont all party working group on lgbtq issues now is there is that is that group working or <laughs> what, what way is it at the moment with everything going on? Well, we, we were actually all there um, a couple of weeks ago. It was a really surreal experience yeah. um, being up at Stormont because obviously it's not sitting at the moment. Yeah. And, the, you know, there were a number of politicians okay. who were there. So Good. to their credit, um, they, they, they were present. Um, but it was really just, yeah, I mean, it. it I think as a lawyer, you know, you're used to representing people and you're used to representing um, people in relation to cases, taking instructions from them. Mm. But actually, this type of thing is about leadership Mm -hmm. and about talking about the things that are important to the people that you represent 
and it's it's broader and it's a bit different. Mm -hmm. And a few of the things that I mentioned during that meeting um, hadn't been mentioned by anybody else. Yeah. And they were about people who were truly voiceless. Mm -hmm. And although I have a commercial sort of practice and legal technology practice, w what I really, really like to do is that bit of activism around giving a voice to people that otherwise wouldn't mm -hmm. have a voice and mm -hmm. using my position as, as a lawyer yeah. to share their stories, albeit most of the time it, it has to be um, shared anonymously. anonymously sure. um, but it's mm -hmm. giving people that platform. That platform. And talking about um, sharing um, voices and giving people that platform... What is the landscape in Northern Ireland in terms of, you know, I know you've been working closely with kind of patching together our history in terms of um, LGBTQ plus issues. Obviously here we're very focused on, you know, our historical past and, and the troubles. But you mentioned that you've been looking at, you know, um, issues from, was it the, the, from the outset of the troubles. How's that going in terms of the um, history project that you've been working on in Northern Ireland? Yeah, it's re it's. I, I got into it and thought that it would be a little bit of a hobby that I knew most of what I was going to learn. Yeah. I, I already knew it, but actually there was ho there's a whole rich tapestry of history that mm. hasn't been captured yet. What's the name of the project? Yes, so the LGBT History Project is a sort of joint exercise by the Rainbow Project, Cara Friend and Here and I and really it's quite, it's ended up being a really exciting and interesting and really rich experience I'd for imagine. all of the people involved yeah. because if you think about it we know we all know about the history of you know, our various institutions and mm -hmm. the various groups and both legal and illegal during the conflict here. But actually, for most of the conflict, mm -hmm. LGBT people were criminalised. Yeah. So that meant that their stories couldn't be told as an act of self-preservation. You know, the, the, the first uh, bar in Belfast for LGBT people was the Carpenter Club and we can't find a photo of that. We the outside the or Carpenter the Carpenter Club. Okay. Yeah, and it's just it's, it, it's an insight into mm. a very different time. Sure. Um and it makes you know it makes the achievements that we have got now a little bit sweeter. But also we have this history project which will capture the stories of the yeah. people who were actually there. Excellent. And during lockdown, we had incredible webinars. Really, just really, w uh, you that's know, a good time to have done that. I, I guess is it? Yeah. Is that where the project started? Was it during lockdown? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it was. It was supposed to be, you know, one Zoom session, and then we would go back ah. to um, be meeting in person, and then obviously COVID hit. Yeah. So all of us were sitting in our houses with nothing better to do, and people were joining from all over. And we had these incredible rich stories because the people who were there were joining our Zoom calls. Yeah. And it was really daunting Amazing. because we were talking about, you know, criminal issues. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking about discrimination and prejudice. And people were sharing really interesting stories that haven't been yeah. written down. And they were sharing photographs that they had. And in lots of people's closets, there are incredible things like that we ended up getting the first telephone that was um the helpline of cara friend and that okay. was the first lgbt organization in um in northern ireland and it's going to be 50 wow. in a little while right. and actually you know cara friend all of the organizers of that were arrested um, pretty much and that is what led to Jeff Dudgeon taking his case to mm -hmm. the European Court of Human Rights and it, it was like that phone service that ended up in litigation and human rights and you know the reason why I can be you know I can walk down the street yeah. as openly gay and I can actually practice as a lawyer because a lot of people forget that mm. 
um, if you were gay, you couldn't be an officer of the court. And I think oh, that I find that incredible. Gosh, and and, and we this still is not that long ago. No, and uh, you know, I sort of think there are a number of practitioners, like a small number of practitioners, who would have dealt with cases under the pre nineteen eighty two law. You know, not very many now, mm-hmm. but there are still some lawyers. Still so before decriminalisation. Yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness, it's hard to get your head around that. And that was in our lifetime. That was mm-hmm. not long ago at all. So leaps and bounds have been made in some respect. But in your opinion, you know, do we have far to go? Are we there in terms of, you know, building and creating this society of complete inclusivity or what is your experience being with you know people who maybe have contributed to your project or that you you work with I mean I think I think it's different for each person Mm -hmm. and for each workplace I think how a business how any business Mm -hmm. treats an LGBT employee is a good bellwether of how decent they are Mm -hmm. as an employer and employers include law firms because they have employees. Yeah. Um, and I think that what I find really sa- quite sad, um, and I think we have to work a lot more on, is that people at the beginning of their career or people who are um, changing roles, sometimes they do go back into the closet. So in okay. one firm... You know, they they feel supported and they feel able to be themselves. And then, you know, they they start their first uh, qualified job or they start a new job and they go back into the closet. And, um, you know, National Coming Out Day is is the 11th of October. Mm. And people think about coming out as being, you know, a one off thing. That you yeah. know, you just do that, and that's that's the end of it. Yeah. As a person, you know, I'm making a decision whether or not mm-hmm. I talk about my boyfriend mm-hmm. to my colleagues on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. Um, if if a client says, "Oh, were you doing anything nice at the weekend?" Yeah. I have to make that decision. Is it appropriate for me as a lawyer? Um, have I got that degree? Like, how? What is yeah. my relationship with that person? Yeah. So it's uh, coming out is just a constant process Absolutely. for people. And I wonder, like, you do see a lot of businesses, you know, um, will you know, um, celebrate Pride, for example, and have. Um, committees, especially law firms as well. You see them, um, some of the corporate law firms will have um, equality and diversity groups. They're trying to, what can businesses do to be more supportive? So that example you gave of somebody who felt supportive, you know, came out and then went back into the closet, as you said, to start a new job. What? How can we stop that from happening? And how can that person maybe feel more supportive? Is it just dependent on the actual culture of that company? Or should we, you know, be supporting some kind of, I don't know, um, guidance that people should sign up to or some sort of mandate how, how might we address that do you think it, it's a really really tough question um, I think that people will feel supported and able to be themselves whenever the people around them show that they are supportive mm-hmm. and you know I've seen some really really powerful shows of allyship mm-hmm. um in in one role i i was i was the head of the diversity and inclusion network and i we were planning pride and i thought we don't have that many lgbt people mm-hmm. um so how do we give our straight colleagues the permission to show their solidarity okay and you know, in a non-threatening way, how do we do that? Because sometimes you have to show people, yes, this is okay. You know, this is the words that you use to describe these things. This is what's appropriate. This is what's not appropriate. Here's a little thing that you can do. And I remember being really nervous and I emailed um, our sports, a couple of our sports teams. Mm -hmm. We were having a sort of five aside against um, some other organisations. And I said, well, you know, this is actually going to be happening quite close mm-hmm. to Pride. How would you feel about rainbow laces? Yeah. Would do you want them? 
and everybody wore rainbow laces. Oh. And there was only one person on the team who was LGBT, but all of the people wanted to show mm-hmm. that they cared about LGBT rights. And that was just, it was That's only a small, small act. Um, so it, it leads me to think sometimes corporations and businesses, I guess, who, you know, celebrate Pride Day, maybe it could be seen as a box ticking exercise in some cases. And I'm not saying that with everybody, but really on the ground, there's little acts, you know, and personal engagement with your colleagues, senior management, whatever it might be in terms of whatever industry you work in, that would make that person feel supportive, supported, sorry, not just the company saying, you know, well, we support Pride or whatever it might be. Is that the case that really it's those kind of, you know, smaller acts or, you know, the people might not necessarily feel supported just because a company say that they're inclusive and open to, you know, or is there a fine line there? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think it has to be authentic. Yeah. Um, and I think it has to be meaningful because mm-hmm. if it isn't, it, it's not really it's not really achieving anything. Yeah. Um, it may get a, a couple more sales, but mm. you know, people people are going to see through that. Yeah. And actually, there's a risk there that LGBT people could become alienated because you know they're just wheeled out for certain mm-hmm. occasions, which sure, yeah. can you know y- you're exposing. Yeah your employees in mm-hmm. a way that it's maybe not, mm-hmm. um, not helpful. It, yeah. Okay, well, there's a lot of work to be done potentially there. And just in terms of your work with the Human Rights and Equality Working Group, I know that they're very active. And um, We had one of the members on before, Maria McCluskey. Um, what issues are you looking at there in terms of, you know, our peers and people working in Northern Ireland in law? It's, it's a really, it has been a really wonderful experience um working with these incredible people Mm -hmm. and we just look at any policies that come across our desk and we also respond to individual solicitor members um where they raise an issue or a concern so it's actually it's really organic Mm -hmm. um group in a way and Mm -hmm. we've been very active we've recently completeded a, a diversity and inclusion survey and I that, that has been, through, yeah. uh, do you know what it? Like we can't change things until we know what we need to change. Um, we have to have some sort of awareness about, you know, where where the issues are, and that's been really really incredible. Mm-hmm. I think we don't exist in a vacuum. Um, so there have been a number of policies yeah. brought in, um, or proposed to be brought in by the UK government which have very serious human rights implications okay. um, you know recently the, the ones on legacy yeah. uh, the redrafting of the Human Rights Act you know these are fundamental mm. to individuals rights and you know we do work with the society and mm. you know we're we're so well supported and well That's brilliant it um, is you can just yeah it's very good it and it's also it. so rewarding i yeah. did i didn't think that um being involved with the law society would be <laughs> it, it, i didn't think that it would be for me and yeah. i didn't think that i would have anything to contribute and yet I'm working with these incredible human rights Brilliant. lawyers. Making real change. Yeah. Uh, well, that's great. And even for all of us to know that that support is there for lawyers across Northern Ireland. And one thing you were involved in recently, which I thought was fantastic, and unfortunately I couldn't be there because I was in London at the time, um, was Pride Belfast this year. And lawyers got together who represent, um, wasn't it, asylum seekers and refugees. And I think I'm right in saying they were pretty much leading the parade. At, at one point, how did that come about? So Lawyers with Pride have um, participated in Pride for a number of years and they're just an incredible group mm-hmm. of LGBT people and allies who work in the legal profession or who are um, law students mm-hmm. as well. And uh, I, re- I remember turning up to my first, it was actually my first Pride mm-hmm. and that I took part in. And I didn't get the memo that everybody was supposed to be in court dress. <laughs> what did you wear? <laughs> so I, I mean, it was only a shirt and jeans, but uh, everybody else was a real lawyer and I wasn't. They were lawyered up. 
<laughs> it, was really, it was really wonderful. Um, but yeah, Lawyers with Pride um, have participated for a number of years and have also brought over incredible speakers yeah. um, like the late Lord Kerr and Master Victoria McLeod, um, the mm-hmm. first trans judge in the UK. Who's incre- well, both of them are incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so the incredible thing about Belfast Pride this year was for many, many people, this was their first Pride because... Yeah. We didn't have prides because of the necessary coronavirus restrictions. Mm-hmm. And it was just, re- it, there was a lovely atmosphere. People were dying to see each other yeah. and feel that sense of solidarity. And there would be a number of people that I would only ever see sort mm-hmm. of at prides in, you know, Newry or Oma yeah. or Belfast. And what was really special this year was a small group of individuals, Mm -hmm. a a grassroots group um, made up of people who work with asylum seekers. Uh, They invited me to come along and meet their queer asylum seekers. And I explained, I explained the meaning of pride and what to expect and the history of pride. And of all of the presentations that I've ever given, I have never had the level of attention that I was given in that room. Wow. These people were coming here. They didn't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. I think for queer asylum seekers, the issue for the people there was they were in shared accommodation, many of them, so they could not be out as being LGBTQ. In wider society they couldn't be out as being asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. So as an act of self-preservation, they were keeping themselves to to themselves. What we did, we had this lovely um, mask-making session and the asylum seekers who have come to this country for our protection, and we should be honoured by that, they made the masks of the countries where it's still illegal to be LGBT. And they were going to wear those masks for their first Pride. So I explained to them about Belfast's first Pride, the history of Pride, individual rights and freedoms, and how they've come around for LGBTQ people. And it was just really, really incredible. And Belfast Pride heard about it and... They invited this group of petrified but very, very brave people to actually lead the parade. Wonderful. So they were the people who were leading it. Amazing. And, you know, we, we can't hear their voices. Yeah. These people have a very difficult path, mm-hmm. even now that they're in this country mm-hmm. and away from the harm in that country. There are still harms that yeah. are a risk for them. Sure. Wow, that is just, it's just fantastic um, and a great way to bring back the celebration of Pride. So f- finally, gosh, I mean, you're so so busy and so involved, um, Jude, in terms of campaigning and really creating a safe space for people in Northern Ireland, um, you know, from all backgrounds. One um, organisation or project you can explain about a little bit more that we, we mentioned, which I find just fascinating, is Queer Space that you talk, spoke about. Um, and it provides, I, I guess, a safe space, which is w- what we're talking about, for people across Northern Ireland who haven't come out, who maybe their family see them as straight, but they come to this group meeting and, you know, feel supported by maybe the only people that they're able to talk to about their authentic self. How does that work out? Yes, um, a few years ago I just felt that I should be doing a little bit more and giving something back. Um, so I started going to queer space meetings and really it, it, it it's just kind of, it's a bit of a rubbish chill out room with mm. sort of sofas that are falling apart and... Um, you know, a (laughs) ragtag bunch of people and really horrendous dilute orange juice that I I think should really be banned. (laughs) Um, But the important thing and the empowering and the powerful thing is that 
this is a group of people who come together. So queer space acts as a safe space for people mm-hmm. to come along and to be themselves. Yeah. It's really, it's really, really bittersweet that there are a number of people who cannot be open with anybody else yeah. in the world on occasion. Except that Except group. that group. Wow. And during lockdown, it was incredibly difficult mm. for LGBTQ people. And they were incredibly isolated. They were in difficult positions. Um, and they had challenging relationships. Mm. And it was a pressure cooker for a lot of yeah, people. Yeah, I'm sure. And we tried to keep up contact to combat that isolation. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a bit of a nightmare organising so many Zoom yeah. sessions and trying to think of interesting and fun things to do. I think we only had about two Zoom quizzes um, the whole time, but we, we, we tried. To, <laughs> oh, yeah, I think you've painful. been doing enough. <laughs> during <laughs> lockdown. I feel very ashamed speaking to you about my restriction time and how it was spent. But, yeah. but anyway. sometimes it was survival. <laughs> survival was enough. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, that's good. I mean, I'm sure the people who benefited from that, even the Zoom, and I know it's different to have the in-person meetup, but I'm sure people benefited massively. And didn't you say people from all over the world were actually chiming in to, to those sessions? Yeah, it was oh, it was really... Um, so at our normal meetings, we would have people from, yeah. you know, as far as kind of Limavadi, Balamina, um, and you know, uh, d- down yeah. in Uri as well, um, who would travel up and be with us. But during lockdown, there were a number of people who had sort of heard mm-hmm. about us and we're not really sure how they heard about us. But I remember one guy joined and he was in a car park and he was in the Middle East and right. we were the first people that he came out to. Wow. And that was only made possible because of you mm-hmm. know technology yeah. which is incredible um we also um through a queer writer um we ended up working a lot with some refugees in the kakuma refugee camp in kenya and that's a camp uh, run by the united nations mm-hmm. and there are a number of queer people who are at risk yeah Um, who are either refugees from other countries in Africa or displaced within that country. And they really formed together for security. And they had a number of grievances in relation to other people and the homophobia, prejudice, discrimination that they were facing. And, you know, we tried to support them. Mm -hmm. And I worked with a couple of them uh, in terms of formulating their arguments and teaching them little oh. bits of advocacy. Brilliant. Um, and it was it was really, really heartbreaking because we knew that they were at risk even though they were um, under the protection of the United Nations. They were still at risk from other people and, and from locals and people within the camp. And really... I was I was devastated um, mm. to have a missed call and then to find out the news a couple of days later that one of the people that I had worked with who really dreamt of being a law- lawyer yeah. um, and working in human rights that in the middle of the night this wonderful um, gay man called Trinidad um homophobes came in and actually covered him with flammable liquid and oh. he ended up dying. Um, oh my goodness. Really, it was very, very... It, it, it really galvanised the importance of the work that it we do. It really, really does. Wow. God, that was so hard. It must have been so difficult for everybody working within that, that group. But it just shows the reality, you know, that this is still a massive issue and people are genuinely living in fear. So the fact that you're able to reach out and provide pe- people who are aspiring lawyers with those skills mm-hmm. that they might not necessarily be exposed to. 
is amazing. So wow, I just achieved. <laughs> <laughs> you're just doing fantastic work oh, thank um, you. throughout. You know, for us, obviously in Northern Ireland, but further afield, obviously. And just, I suppose it's activist lawyer our podcast, and you're very much an activist lawyer or an activist and a lawyer both. Um, so just for people listening, what does that mean to you? How important is it? I guess in general, but also from your perspective, you know, to use activism as a change, maybe to to impact law. Do they mesh well together? Or are they? Do you see them as separate kind of mechanisms? What What are your thoughts? I think there's a bit of both. I think that the law is just a set of tools um, for the practitioner. Mm-hmm. I think activism is fundamentally about showing that you care about something yeah and you know my sense of activism is about you know honoring the people who have come before me Mm -hmm. in you know a variety of fields um and also basically leaving my little corner of the world a little bit better um whenever i leave and we just there's so much potential yeah. with activism. Um, you know, thinking about how individuals engage with rights, it doesn't take a legal education to do that. Mm-hmm. It just takes curiosity about law. And, you know, I ha- there are so many just inspirational f- people that I sort of listen to whenever I'm feeling a wee bit down. Yeah. Um, and law is sometimes really a bit bad and it needs to be challenged and it needs to be sort of assessed where the margins of that is Mm -hmm. um you know we saw yeah one of my favorite lawyers is mary robinson Mm -hmm. and lots of people think oh she is wonderful she was the first female president of ireland she was really really amazing yeah but if you actually look into her background mm-hmm. and her, the cases that she acted in. Um, she acted uh, for her friend, uh, Senator David Norris, whenever he That's brought right. the Irish state to court. Um, and they ended up losing, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, and what what I really love about that story is mm-hmm. they, they lost the case uh, before the High Court in Ireland. Um, but then eventually there were a number of... Um, motions that were brought Mm -hmm. and it was decriminalised and by that stage Mary Robinson was able to sign in the bill as president so she was able to achieve something as president that she wasn't as a lawyer but I think the incredible story and I just do you know what I'm just fascinated by her and I think it's it's about curiosity about the law Um, there was a Cork woman called Giussieri and um, I just I, I really love sharing her story Mm -hmm. because I think it honours her name um, and it also sort of reminds us to be a bit activist-y in whatever tiny way that we could be. Yeah. So Josie Airy was, um, uh, she had a number of really, really low pay jobs. Mm -hmm. Um, She also had an abusive husband and he was very violent towards her, ended okay. up with a ended up going to prison. Um, but divorce wasn't legal in Ireland right. at the time and it was a very, very difficult time to to be a woman or to be any type of minoritized individual in Ireland and in the UK at that time. But what she did I think is just incredible. So she knew that she needed something. Her husband got out of prison and she wasn't safe. She couldn't get a deed of separation. She couldn't get a divorce. But she had heard about a thing called the European Court of Human Rights. So she actually wrote to, she just wrote directly to the European Court of Human Rights and said, this is what's happening. Uh, I need to be safe. Um, not I can't pay any of the solicitors in Cork because I have no money because mm-hmm. I make very, very little. But I need protection. I need 
to feel safe and what can you do, European Court of Human Rights? And <laughs> they actually wrote back and said, yeah, there's maybe a tiny bit of an arguable case here. Yeah. Um, we're going to actually give you funding to bring a case. My goodness. And she picked Mary Robinson as her counsel. Wow. But that's the foundation yeah. of civil legal aid in Europe. My this goodness. one woman that's amazing. from Cork. And I, I did I not just, know that. I absolutely love her. What's I her name again, Jude? Uh, Josie Airy. Josie I think she Airy. was technically called yeah. Joanna Airy, but Josie Airy. Fantastic. Ari. Wow. And that just shows the potential yeah, that absolutely. one person has. Oh my goodness, that is fascinating. Well, all of um, the examples you've given today and just your journey itself is just amazing and I'm sure of real interest to some of our listeners. And um, I follow you on LinkedIn and I can see (laughs) certain things that you're up to, but it would be great to check in with you again and um, follow you for, you know, all of the work that you're doing. Um, I know you're on Twitter and you're on LinkedIn and hopefully that I'd like to find out more about the history project as well Um, in Northern Ireland. It just sounds fascinating. So, I mean, thank you so much again for joining me today. Oh, it was really, really lovely, despite the torrential rain. Despite the weather and the lack of scone. That scone didn't arrive yet, I see, <laughs> in the studio. Um, next time we'll have a proper a proper welcome, proper Nuri welcome for you. But um, again, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was wonderful. This podcast was recorded in Granite Podcast Studio. Interested in starting up your own podcast but don't know how? Granite Podcast Studio can help. Record your podcast in our state-of-the-art studio, which is based in the heart of Newry City. Our studio has cutting-edge and user-friendly technology and can seat up to four people. We also provide an editing service for our team using your guidance and editing notes to provide you with a flawless finished product, leaving your listeners wanting more. For more information on how you can get started, visit www.granitepodcaststudio.com.